Um, I know this is the last talk of the day, so I'll try to make this fun. Um, a little background on this talk. I gave this at Black Hat in uh, 2018. Did any of you go to Black Hat last year? No? So part of, part of that Black Hat talk had these historical analogies. It had uh, some various use cases, different places in the world, et cetera. And somebody said, hey, you know what would be cool? If you just made a presentation that was predicated on those bits and pieces. I said, okay. So I kind of put this together, you know, 30 40% based on that. And people seem to like it. So um, I hope you guys enjoy. It's kind of a fun talk. And I think we're going to have a good time. A uh, little bit of background. Oop. A little bit of background on me. Uh, so I've been in security for about 20 years. I've helped build a whole bunch of companies, uh, RipTech, ArcSight, Imperva, Solera Networks. I uh, spent a lot of fun. I'm on some boards like Silence and Jask and things like that. Written a couple books. I uh, wrote my last book with the director of the NSA. And I did a, a documentary on HBO with uh, General Michael Hayden a little while ago as well. Um, I only say this, one, because I am narcissistic. Uh, but two, <laughs> I say it just because a lot of these stories come from my involvement in these particular areas. So that's kind of the base of it. So quick raise of hands, and we won't count Wakanda, who feels we probably live in one of the most technological periods in time right now, right? Not, not a trick question, right? Okay. It's, it's funny when people don't raise their hand. I go, how could it be different? Except somebody once told me if, we, if Rome had not sacked Greece, that by 1492 we would have actually had a manned expedition to Mars if their technology kept on increasing at the same rate. But my dad told me that. He's from Greece, consider the source. Um, but the reason I put this up here is it seems like every time we develop something kind of cool in tech, somebody tries to hack it, exploit it, especially when it becomes commercialized. Um, and that leads to bad things, but sometimes those bad things actually lead to good things, and I'll kind of show you where those connections are made as well. And as everybody in this room knows, technology advancement isn't linear. Every once in a while, we take a big leap just like we have here. So Joseph Marie Jacquard, uh, he invented this thing. This was the automatic lumen, 1804, it predated Babbage. So arguably, and there's a lot of arguments about this, it's the world's first computer, mechanical computer, but computer nonetheless. And what's it look like? It looks like computer punch tape, right? Which was the predecessor to computer punch cards. Had input, output, memory, what we would define as a computer. Anyways, this thing allowed a factory to go from making about 10 blankets a day in a textile mill to making almost 100 blankets a day in a textile mill. Now, every once in a while, you're going to see one of these little $25 uh, things up here uh, for audience participation. And I'll ask a question. So you guys will raise your hand. I'll pick somebody if you get it right. Uh, please, at the end of the event, go to the far corner in the back here. We have a couple of representatives up. Christine, can you raise your hand? That, that gal right back there. Uh, you can just give her your email address or business card, whatever, and she will go ahead and send you an uh, Amazon gift uh, email for $25. So uh, the question here, and please raise your hand, how do you think the employees reacted to having this computer brought into the office? Uh, yes, sir. Correct. <laughs> Very negatively. In fact, history is a little squishy here. Um, but they say that's where the term saboteur came from, or sabotage, because they actually snuck in one night because they said, shit, this machine, this computer, they didn't call it a computer, is going to take our jobs. Why do I want it sitting around? So they broke it and they smashed it to pieces. And I always thought it was very ironic that the world's first computer suffered an insider threat. <laughs> so we go a little bit further. We get to things like radio, 1895. And I know with this audience, you guys know Marconi, the father of radio. Um, he's the guy right there. So Marconi had this idea, and it's kind of funny today if we think about wired and wireless ethernet. He said, we've got these wired telegraph systems that are wired point to point. What if we could replace wired telegraph with wireless, and we'll go point to point with that. It'll be just as safe, just as secure. We won't have to build the infrastructure. It's an interesting idea. Now this guy over here, who looks uh, evil, John Neville Mascalini, was not a friend of his. You probably don't know John, but he was the inventor of the pay toilet. History didn't uh, view him as well as Marconi. Um, he didn't like Marconi. So Marconi said, you know, I'm going to set up this big event. I'm going to go to the Royal Academy of Science in London, and I'm going to show people how wireless radio can go ahead and kick the ass of wired telegraph, and it's just as safe, just as secure. 
And he set up this transmission tower, he set up a receiver, and he set up this sort of like teletype device, so when the signal came through, the mores, it would, it would print it out, it would basically read to the audience what it was. Now Marconi was super excited about this. This was gonna change the world, right? So he invites his professors, he invites the media, everybody from town, Jill Kite, the girl from his junior prom that turned him down because he didn't have cool enough hair. Everybody was here, right? And it was a big deal, and he's getting ready to transmit. What he didn't know, though, John set up another tower with higher amplitude, which went ahead and trumped Marconi's signal. So this is what was received on the printer when it came through. There was a young fellow of Italy who diddled the public quite prettily. And it went on to very colorful metaphors that I won't put up there. So Marconi's like, fuck, you pay toilet asshole. Why would you do this? Um, and people said, okay, wired radio will never, or wireless radio will never be a replacement. And, and John's whole point behind this was, look, man, you, you can't secure this. And at the time, he was correct. You can't secure this. Somebody can have a stronger signal. It can be intercepted. It's just not as secure as wired, right? Because we didn't have the infrastructure or the technology at that point to do anything. Now, we have mobile phones in 1943. Now, they're called mobile because you could stick them on the back of a flatbed truck or a battleship. They probably caused cancer, and they definitely caused the hair to fall out. Um, but now you guys have seen that, so I can write that off as a business expense when I went to San Diego. That's all I really have to say about that one. Um, but now we have the digital renaissance, as I call it. And we'll reference this later on in the conversation. But this is sort of 1973 till today. You know? TCP IP, Ethernet, the PC, um, social media, all the way up to sort of the pinnacle of civilization, I think we'd all agree today, which is, of course, skip intro on Netflix, right? <laughs> um, but let's talk more about exploitation. When something becomes commercialized, there's always somebody that tries to exploit that. It doesn't always happen overnight. Sometimes it happens over centuries or more. First example here. The first recorded history we have of people using the sea for trade was 3000 BC. Somebody said, hey, you got some stuff over here? I got some stuff over here. Why don't we stick it on a boat and we'll trade? 3000 BC. The first recorded pirates weren't until 1300 BC. It took 2,000 years before somebody said, well, shit, let's just rob the boat. That's a pretty big threat window. When's the last time Microsoft or Adobe or anybody had a 2,000 year threat window? Um, but now we have the commercialization of air. So John Weiss said, hey, I'm going to use this thing called the hot air balloon, and I'm going to use it to move mail. I said, okay. It was a really cool idea. It actually crashed. It exploded. It ended horribly. But academically, it was interesting. We didn't have the first hijacking until 1931. It was actually in Peru. Okay? Not 2,000 years, but a pretty big threat window there as well. So now we go to space, satellite. Satellite warfare is its own little subdomain in security. There's not a lot about that. But Sputnik, a couple of years after Sputnik, you had the satellite called Telestar. Telestar was being used for television broadcasting, uh, and it was owned by AT&T at the time. We had a couple uh, command and control botnet uh, management uh, stations that had been set up through the Tula network and things like that where they had compromised satellite systems. Typically, satellite systems are designed with the base station and then the satellite, so we don't see a lot there for that, but still a, a relatively large threat window. But then Al Gore came along and he gave us the internet. And the first commercialization of the internet happened roughly around 1988 when MCI mail and NSFNet said, hey, we've got people that are using email. You've got people that are using email. Let's charge them money so they can email each other. And if anyone's familiar with the Morris worm, pretty much happened at the exact same time. His dad worked for the NSA. He built an exploit that exploited Finger. It also did some character generation redirect into Echo, so you had this constant loop going on in the network. But the threat window went down to pretty much zero from 2,000 years. So while we see commercial exploitation isn't something new. It definitely happens at an accelerating rate. Now, does anybody know this name, Joy Bubbles? Nobody? So Joy Bubbles had a unique skill. He happened to be blind, and this was in the late 50s, early 60s, but he could whistle at 2,600 hertz, which was a really cool skill back then. 
because back then, telephone systems didn't use SS7, System Signaling 7, which meant that all your communication traffic and all your management traffic were all in the same band. Now it's actually separated. But if you could pick up a payphone, and for those of you younger, they used to have these things called payphones. You put money in them. Um, he could pick up a payphone and whistle in it, and it was the equivalent of putting a coin, I don't know what it cost, a nickel, a 10 cents, I don't know. It was equivalent of putting money in the phone and he could make calls for free. But not many people could do that. That was a pretty unique skill. Then this guy came around, John Draper. Some people know him as Captain Crunch. He actually didn't discover this Captain Crunch whistle that could make 2,600 hertz. Somebody else did, but he definitely made it popular. Uh, he opened up a box of cereal one day, hey, this whistle's neat. Tried it on a payphone, sure enough, he could be just like Joy Bubbles. Now this started to catch on a little bit. Esquire magazine in 1971 publishes this magazine called, or this article called, The Secrets of the Little Blue Box. And the blue box was a device that could be used to create 2600 hertz. If you couldn't whistle, or you didn't like Captain Crunch, maybe you're more of a Frosted Flakes person. Somebody thought this was a cool idea. And they were in college. They said, hey, why don't I start building this for all my dorm mates? And I'll actually sell these blue boxes. And here's Steve Wozniak on a phone holding a blue box that he used to create 2600 hertz. And what's interesting about this is if you talk to him, I've actually met him, uh, he will tell you that this was some of the back end funding that was used to create the first Apple computer, the very first Apple computer out of homebrew and all that other stuff. So pretty cool stuff. So sometimes good comes from the bad. And by the way, I met him at Comic-Con, and he was fucking awesome. If you ever get a chance to meet Steve, has anybody met Steve Wozniak? He's like one of the smartest dudes ever. Did you ever hear the story about his differential equations class in, in college? So, all right, I'll tell you. This is a side, but I'll tell you. So Steve's in this differential equations class. Teacher gives him back his test, and he's got an F on it. And he's like, why did you give me an F? I know all these answers are right. He said, you didn't show any work. It's impossible for you to have gotten these questions right without you know, just doing it in your head and not showing any work. He goes, well, that's how I did it. He goes, fine. So the teacher writes up this problem on the blackboard. Steve looks at it for a few minutes and writes the answer. So the teacher checks it. It's right. He looks at Steve. He goes, there's no reason you should be in college. You should get out. And that was his story. And then he talks for like five hours, and his handler has to say, that's enough. Other people are waiting in line to take a picture. But now you've seen the picture, so I can write off my trip to Comic-Con now. So this whole talk is about me getting free trips. So 1971, we start getting into malware. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but the very first malware was called Creeper, very first virus we'll call it, was called Creeper. It was written for the DEC PDP. It wasn't malicious. It was just designed to see could we create self-replicating code, and in fact, we could. The term virus didn't even kick in until 83, and the PC virus, of course, the brain in 1985. But then we jump over to these guys, 2001, Code Red. What was interesting about Code Red, I wasn't working in security in 71, but I was in 2001, is propagation speeds changed dramatically. Where things might take months or longer to propagate, all of a sudden now things are propagating in days or hours, right? So that was huge. But what was even bigger was SQL Slammer in 2003, if any of you were in the industry at that time. SQL Slammer doubled its infection rate every eight and a half seconds, and within 10 minutes, 90% of all reachable machines were compromised. That was badass back then. That was like end of the world stuff. Now, there was a gentleman, I forget his name, he was a PhD student at Berkeley at the time. You can look up his paper, it was called Warhol Threats. And Warhol Threats was based on Andy Warhol's statement that in the future, everyone's gonna be famous for 15 minutes or less. His idea was in the future, a worm would be able to take out the internet in 15 minutes or less. This was the first time we got anything close to that. So it's a really interesting read, by the way, if you want to check out his paper. So now I was told that I should tell a joke to break things up, because that's a lot of content. And I get in trouble sometimes. Um, so I'm just going to tell a regular joke. Why are Romans so good in algebra? Because x always equals 10. Huh? Come on, I got that off Reddit. You guys suck. That was the Reddit joke. All right. Did anybody ever hear the name Gary Ming? Okay. Gary was a chemical engineer that used to work for DuPont. And DuPont only has maybe half a dozen competitors globally. He decides after about 10 years as an employee, he wants to go work for a competitor that happened to be in China. So during Gary's last few months, he starts downloading documentation and product details that he had legitimate access to 
that he needed access to to do his job. White papers and research documents and new formulas and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, marketing plans. But when they looked at what he downloaded, the aggregate was 15 times higher than everybody else in DuPont combined, which unless you're a backup server, that's a freaking huge anomaly, right? So they raided his home. And when they raided his home, he was uh, demagnetizing hard drives, he was shredding paper, et cetera, so he got wind that the bus was coming, right? They recovered $400 million worth of intellectual property from a guy that did nothing but access to information he was supposed to have access to, but he got greedy and he did it out of volume that raised suspicion. To put $400 million into perspective, that's 8,000 Teslas. And in this room, we all know anything over 7,500 is just pretentious. But 8,000 Teslas he stole by doing nothing more than accessing stuff he was supposed to do. This guy, who just looks evil, his name's Jerome Krebel. Now, Jerome is French, and he worked for a French bank called Soc Gen or Soc General. Um, Jerome did two things that were interesting. One, he used to be a software developer, and he, developed the code, he coded the software that was being used for Soc Gen for all their traders. Then, later on, he says, I don't want to be a software developer anymore. I want to study finance, and then I want to go ahead and trade hedge funds. He was using the same software to trade that he actually had written. He actually stole seven billion dollars, one of the largest insider threat takes in history. And just kind of a fun fact, if you're going to steal a billion, go ahead and just steal seven billion, because it's the same amount of time in jail, and you can get much better lawyers, you can probably buy your own island. Put that in perspective, 140,000 Teslas, doing nothing more than leveraging software that he had written that had holes in it that he knew how to exploit. So here's a really interesting one. Here, you can look this up as well. This is when I used to be with McAfee Labs. And this is called 10 Days of Rain. If you Google it, you'll see the white paper. I was part of it. Uh, George Kurtz, who's now the uh, CEO of CrowdStrike, Stuart McClure uh, from Silence, and a bunch of others. Uh, but this was a really interesting one. It had to do with North Korea and South Korea. So North Korea was targeting South Korea with some denial of service attacks. and you know, other basic things like black hat search engine optimization, kind of low-level stuff. And they had a multi-tier botnet architecture, which means it was hard to take down because if you have a botnet manager in one country and then you have another botnet manager in another country and another manager in another country, you build this hierarchy kind of like DNS, it becomes a political issue because maybe the United States is happy to take it down, but Brazil won't. Or maybe El Salvador will, but Laos won't. So you ha it takes a lot of time. So they had a very a uh, significantly deployed hierarchical botnet architecture as part of this attack. They also used a whole bunch of encryption, not just one type, but a whole bunch of types of encryption, which meant if you're trying to do um, static analysis by looking at the code, if you're able to get a hold of the malware, you can't. You have to do dynamic analysis. And on this particular time, back in 2011, it was a lot slower to do that. It was a very slow process. It also had very advanced code written with least privileges. And as you guys know, A doesn't know what B is doing, B doesn't know what A is doing, but C knows what A and B is doing. We all know that's usually indicative of nation state actors that will use that type of coding or military government type coding practices. Okay, so remember these points. So they basically built this awesome architecture, very powerful, very capable, highly secure. It's almost analogous to saying they built like the world's best tank, and now they're just shooting rubber bands out of it. Because the attacks that they used were DNS query, HTTP request, ping floods, ping of death. Like, ooh, ICMP echo request three, what's happening? Oh, I don't know. I mean, that was really cool like in 1994. Not so cool in 2011. So they built this badass machine to do these attacks that were probably the weakest sauce you could imagine. Maybe just one tier better than uh, the Morris attacks back in 88. And the code lacked a command interpreter which means all it could do and all it could ever do was these weak sauce attacks. It couldn't be edited. You couldn't do, uh, use it for spam. You couldn't use it for phishing attacks. You couldn't do it for malware distribution, all that cool stuff. You could just do these stupid attacks. So you built this awesome weapon to do stupid attacks. Then the system had to self-destruct. After 10 days of attacking, it destroyed itself, and it also destroyed the system it was on by overriding everything. Why would you do that? Why would you have an army of hundreds of thousands of systems, and that's just destroy it. We've seen botnet armies that are actually larger in processing capability and network bandwidth than Google and Amazon combined. 
massive, massive capabilities. Think of the power that gives you. Why would you destroy something like that? Right? Well, and the reason you destroy it is because then nobody can investigate it and really dig into the code. So we worked with Interpol on this. We worked with a lot of agencies, a lot of US agencies as well, South Korean government. There's no money for this one, so you guys can just yell it out. Why do you think North Korea did this? What do you think was the motivation of, of this attack on South Korea, given everything you've just heard? I'm sorry? Spite. I'm sorry? Testing. So what they were doing was poking them. They didn't care about the attack. They didn't care about the target. North Korea simply wanted to see how long would it take North, South Korea to respond. What would they do? Who would they call? When did they bring in the United States? When did they bring in Interpol? Were they able to actually reverse engineer their code? If they did, did it take five days? Did it take eight days? Did it take five hours? So they launched this attack, they stopped, sat back and they watched, and they measured, and they learned. And that's what it was. And during this attack, things were tense, but directly after this attack, things were freaking super tense, because they go, what's coming now? Because now they know our capabilities, probably better than we know. It, the only thing I can think of that was similar when I was there, just in terms of tension, was after 9-11, and we didn't know, I, I live in San Francisco, it's like, is somebody gonna hit the Golden Gate Bridge? Is somebody gonna hit something else, right? There, every, everybody was thinking, we're all watching the news 24 hours a day. That's what it was like, what was gonna come next? Nothing horrible came after this, but it was a really, really interesting test. It's the only time I've ever seen anything like this happen at this scale, so pretty interesting. 10 days of rain, you can read the whole white paper if you're interested in it. Um, the thing about nation state actors, though, and you guys probably know this, not everybody knows, is the line that delineates cyber criminals from nation state actors is opaque. I might be a nation state actor by day, but maybe I'm a cyber criminal at night. And we see this everywhere. We see it in Eastern Europe, we see it in parts of Asia, we see a lot of it in the Middle East, that these people are actually the same folks, using the same tools, the same capabilities, the same peer groups, et cetera, et cetera. So saying, oh, this is a nation state actor, it might be somebody that does nation state work, but they could probably be cyber criminals as well. So you see a lot of that. And the reason why is a lot of these countries give them safe harbor. And it's very similar to the pirates, the pirates in the Caribbean. Not, not Johnny Depp, but the actual pirates in the Caribbean. Um, in the late 1600s, early 1700s, you had all these pirates that hung out in the Bahamas. And they basically said, look, pirates, you can come here and do all your pirate stuff, whatever it is pirates do. Train parrots or carve peg legs, make maps, apparently throw balls and, and galas, a lot of pirate, pirate dances. Um, and they said, do all your pirate stuff, but every once in a while the Spanish are going to come, and they're going to try to come and invade us, and it would be awesome if you guys could go out there and shoot them and chop them up. And they said, hey, this is a great deal. And that's what they did. And they had safe harbor to do their pirate stuff as long as they helped out that country when the Spanish came. We see this with the Nashi Youth Group in Russia, the RBN. We see this between Turkey and Iran. We see this with people doing false flags in China where it's not actually Chinese, it's actually Eastern Europeans that have, are actually living in mainland China and operating out of these bases, but they hide their politically motivated attacks under the guise of all the cyber attacks and noise that comes out of China. These things are all layered on top of each other, but the point is the nation state actors and the cyber actors are often the same people, which makes things a little bit interesting when you're going after people. Why can't we never catch these cyber criminals? Because they're working for the fucking government. I swear sometimes. Um, so cyber, what we're finding, is becoming this awesome equalizer, right? And I always love this quote from Samuel Colt. God made man, but Samuel Colt made them equal in reference to the Colt revolver. Doesn't matter if you're a 80-pound person going up against a 300-pound person, Colt revolver makes things even. Truth in advertising, Samuel Colt never said that. His PR agency did, but it stuck, so we'll keep it throughout history. Um, but the thing about cyber is it's cheap. It's cheap. It's cheap to hack, juxtaposed to enriching uranium or building a heat shield so your ICBM can re-enter the Earth's atmosphere without burning up. Much cheaper than that. Um, low attribution. I'm pretty sure if you drove a tank across someone's border, they're probably going to notice where it came from. A hack, quite a bit harder, as we all know. It's easy, again. You can train people to be hackers much more quickly than nuclear physicists, generally. And you don't have to be a nation state. You probably do need to be a nation state to build a submarine of, of significant size, a uh, nuclear weapon, generally speaking. But you can be a minor actor, you can be a splinter cell, you can be a terrorist organization, you can be all these great things that Tom Clancy writes about, right? And it compresses space and time. 
A bullet only has a finite distance. A cyber attack doesn't have any. So it doesn't matter if you're the United States, Russia, or China, or you're Laos, El Salvador, or Peru. It's equalized now. So there's massive investment happening here. And this technology is shifting advantage. And now you're going to start seeing maps redrawn, flags change. And this has happened all throughout history. There's no reason to think it's not going to happen now. Uh, a couple examples. Who's seen the movie 300? Right. I can tell you, being Greek, I don't know where those abs come from, because I don't know any Greek people with abs like that. Um, I do have them, but they're under my protective karate fat. Um, so they ran the ancient world, no, no question about it. And they did it with bronze, and they did it with iron, and they had the phalanx unit, which was very, very successful if you're marching on flat land in a straight line. Then the Romans came around with this thing called the gladius sword, which is a design they actually took from the Spanish, and they used this thing called steel. Our perspective today, it's not highly technologically advanced, but it was then. And they said, let's change our strategy. Instead of just running out these pointy sticks straight, why don't we flank them? Why don't we fight them in the woods or on muddy roads or in the hills? And they sacked them with a relatively simple advancement and a little bit of a change to their tactics. Um, we go to the 15th century, the Ottoman Empire, modern-day Turkey. They had the Janissaries. They didn't invent gunpowder. They didn't invent the muskets. And these weren't even rifled muskets, so they weren't very accurate. But they said, hey, these muskets are going to change warfare. We're going to train everybody that we can to use a musket. And you can make somebody pretty effective with a musket in about a week. To use a longbow and be effective, it could take years before you can hit a barn. Right? So you've got this this army with, you get a musket, you get a musket, you get a musket, you get a musket. This guy, Steve, he gets a pointy stick. Nobody likes Steve. <laughs> he, I, he, he's probably saying, well, shit. <laughs> Why do I have to run with the pointy stick? But who was charging them? People with chainmail armor, leather, leather armor, maybe plate, plate armor. The musket's still going to go through it. It was still much easier to use. So could you imagine ancient or kind of medieval era Warfare tactics being leveraged against gunpowder. It didn't work out very well, and they were hugely, hugely successful because they adopted it, and they knew it was a game changer. Then we go to World War II Germany. Who saw the movie Fury with Brad Pitt? So this is the Tiger tank that the Germans had. On paper, in every possible way, decades ahead in terms of how advanced it was and how capable it was compared to like the US Sherman tanks, uh, Russian tanks as well. It was just a badass tank. Now, it took a long time to learn how to drive that tank. It took a long time for people to know how to operate this tank. And in addition to that, if something broke in the tank, you needed a really good supply chain to replenish it and fix that thing, because they were like finely tuned clocks. If you looked at the US Sherman tank that Brad Pitt was driving, if you could drive a car, you could drive that tank. It wasn't very uh, sexy. It didn't have nearly the same capabilities, but it was easy to build, it was easy to operate, it was easy to maintain, and the US had a much better supply chain. So it was much, much more effective in warfare. Russia was somewhere in between. What Russia did that was really interesting is they said, look, these tanks are only going to last three to six months, then they're going to get blown up. Don't paint it. Don't put a comfortable seat in there. And the guys that are building it, guess what? You guys get to drive it now. That was their model. It's also why they had a very high, high death toll in Russia. But even though this tank was much better by design, the complexity trumped it, and it was not successful. So a little fun fact here. How many tanks do you think Germany had in World War I? Not two, but World War I. Who said that? What would you say? 20. 20. Yeah, nobody ever guessed. How would you know that? Nobody ever guessed that. That's awesome. Good for you. Very cool. 20. Not a lot. Do you know why? Because German officers thought it was stupid. And they go, this isn't going to make sense. You know how they use, what they used for communication? Because they didn't even have wireless back then? They used pigeons. So you drive around with these 20 tanks with pigeons in the back. That must have been awesome. So now World War II kicks in. But right before World War II, there was this treaty that was signed, as we all know, that said, Germany, you're not allowed to build tanks. So Germany said, fine, we're not going to build tanks. We're going to build tractors. This factory over here is going to build this piece. This factory over here is going to build this piece, but this factory over here puts all those pieces together, and guess what? It's a fucking tank. Guess how many tanks they had in World War II compared to the 20 they had in World War I? 160,000 tanks and other armored vehicles. 
or a lot more than 20. Because Rommel, Desert Fox, who tried to kill Hitler, by the way, um, said, you know what? This is going to change warfare. I've been on the ground. I've seen what it can do. We need to go hard. And they, were almost, they almost won because of that decision. Luckily, their tank was so complex and their supply lines sucked so bad that they couldn't maintain it. So most of the countries we go to war with today, the US goes to war with today, are armed with AK-47s. There's about 100 million of these made. You can drive over with the tank. You can bury it in mud. You can uh, submerse it in salt water. You wipe it off with your sleeve, it's good to go. Very simple, very easy. These countries are fighting other countries that are armed with ICBMs and stealth fighters, smart dust, prompt global nuclear strike, where you can hit any place on the planet in 60 minutes or less, drones. How do you compete? The answer is you don't, at least not kinetically. So kinetic warfare is kind of going the way of the Industrial Revolution. And this is another example where we're seeing this in, uh, in play. So here's another $25 question. You have to raise your hand, please. This aircraft carrier here belongs to a country in Latin America. It's the only country in Latin America that owns an aircraft carrier. Who would like to raise their hand and then guess which country? Yes, sir, in the red shirt. Brazil. This aircraft carrier was built in 1963. To put that in perspective, that's the year that Let's Go Surfing Now premiered from the Beach Boys. It's old. Brazil only has two jets. They bought them from Kuwait. So I was in Rio. That was their version of the Defense Naval Graduate School. They didn't build this to be their aircraft carrier, to carry aircraft. They built this to be their floating cyber warfare vessel. So unless you're OK with the satellite latency, or you've got a really fucking long fiber optic cables, it's not a great idea. But they decide to do it. And it kind of makes you a big target. But they bought this massive kinetic device that's used for brute strength warfare. They don't go to war with anybody, by the way. But they bought it maybe over a soccer game. But they did this. And they turn it into a floating cyber warfare vessel. I just think it's a perfect picture of the evolution from kind of industrial warfare to digital. So up here, I was in Vietnam. I was meeting with the Vietnamese Ministry of Defense. And this was two years ago. And they said that they are now spending more training their, their soldiers in cyber warfare than kinetic warfare. They're spending more money on cyber than bombs and bullets. Crazy, right? And then this last one, I know it's a little hard to see. That's me. I thought I was the tallest person in South Korea until I met this guy over here. Um, they have this. If, has anybody here been to South Korea? A couple of you. It's one of the most technologically advanced and sophisticated countries in the world. They are plugged in, online, STEM savvy, all of them every day, all the time. They also have a high suicide rate, but they're very, very plugged in. Um, they have this competition once a year called Best of the Best. And they look for the 60 best hackers in the entire country. And they do basically capture the flag competitions. And they held them in gymnasiums, school gymnasiums all over the country. Uh, it's not a huge country, so I think it's like 15 or, or 20 of these things. And it's 48 hours, and they just sit there and try to capture the flag. And they're mostly high school kids, college kids, etc. So when they did this, there was this one girl She's really hard to see in this picture. She's hard to see even if it was blown up, but she's got a red hat on. She's 16 years old. She was in this gymnasium, and she was just sitting back on her phone, playing games, eating ramen, whatever, just doing stuff, and not doing everything but trying to capture a flag. So while everyone's got their systems up, and everything's plugged in, and they're hacking away, they're hacking away, hacking away at these servers trying to capture the flag, she was sitting back. What they didn't know is she built all the devices that people were plugging their systems into, all the USB ports, et cetera. So while they were hacking the servers, she was hacking them. So when they did a count at the end, they said, Bob, what did you get? There's a lot of guys in South Korea named Bob. Bob goes, oh, I got three flags. Steve, what did you get? I got five flags. They asked the 16-year-old girl what she got. Oh, I got 27 flags. Probably the best hacker I've ever met in my entire life. Out of all my tribe, I've worked in like 50 countries. Freaking amazing. And she was one of the 60 that got to be part of this group. This group was invented for one reason. Remember 2011, 10 days of rain? That's why they built this. It's called Kitri. They get $25 million a year to fund these guys, mostly teenagers, because they've got a fucking crazy upstairs neighbor in North Korea, all because of 10 days of rain. So it's interesting how those things come full circle. Um, we started working with this oil and gas company 
And that says Petrobras, which is a Brazilian oil company. This was not the company it happened to. It just had the coolest picture of the, of the derrick. Um, so this oil and gas company, you know, multinational, multi-billion dollar company, just huge, as, as most, of them are, most of them are pretty big. Um, they suffered a whaling attack, you know, spear fishing on the executives. And then we traced it back. The initial way in was somebody saying, hey, CEO, I got a great picture of your daughter scoring a game at the last, scoring a goal at the last soccer game. And they can find out who has kids that play sports or whatever pretty easily on social media, right? So what parent isn't going to double click on that, especially if it looks like it's coming from somebody they know? That was the entry point. So they got access to some of the C-level executives. This compromise went over two years. And in that two-year time, they had over 80% of all C-level executives in this multinational oil and gas company systems compromised. They captured every keystroke, read every document, every correspondence. They turned on the microphone. They turned on the video camera. Could you imagine that on the laptop of the CEO for a huge company like this? And this is what made things worse. When you find an oil deposit, and I learned all this uh, when I was part of this, let's say they find an oil deposit off the coast of Rio, and the technology that exists today doesn't allow you to drill it. So you buy a future. You say, well, I think within 10 years, we'll have the capabilities to drill that deep. And somebody else goes, ah, I don't agree. I think it's going to take 12 years, or maybe it's going to take three years. And you bet, and you buy these futures. So it's, it's this closed bidding system. It's a little bit like gambling or hedge fund trading. But if you know what your competitors are doing and what they're saying, it's not a closed bid for you anymore. Chevron says, oh, I'm going to bid $3 billion. So Exxon can say, oh, I'm going to bid $3 billion in one. It's like the price is right, right? Everybody hates that guy. But now you have a situation where it's related to oil and gas, which means it's related to power and energy, which means it's related to power. And things like this are the things that actually do change maps. And they do change flags. So those are very, very... Uh, scary attack that happened to this company, all because somebody wanted to see a picture of their daughter scoring a goal in soccer. I think the moral of the story is don't let your kids play sports. Um, I'm not sure. Um, but it was also interesting, kind of an aside for the story, they didn't stop there. They actually sidestepped into their SCADA control systems that they use for refining as well. Um, all the intellectual property in oil and gas isn't stored in an Oracle database or SAP or something. It's stored in PLCs and historians, programmable logic controllers, industrial control systems. These devices, a lot of them are like Windows NT 4.0, and they depreciate them over decades, right? So you can't patch it. You can't update it. If you look at it sideways, it falls over and dies, but it's holding the crown jewels of the company. And they can't secure it because it breaks the warranty with the vendor. So there's all this weird political stuff that happens when you get into these systems, that digital systems that control physics, pressure, um, temperature, flow, et cetera. But they stole all that, too. For two years, for two years, they just kind of picked their pockets, right? It's a very interesting story. Um, this one you might have heard of. Who's heard the name American Superconductor? OK. So just like 10 Days of Rain, if you want to Google it, 60 Minutes did a piece on this called The Great Brain Robbery, like the Great Train Robbery. This is the Great Brain Robbery. And uh, a guy that I used to work with, um, uh, George Kurtz, who's uh, the CEO of CrowdStrike. Uh, we were at McAfee Labs together. He was uh, in this interview. So American Superconductor builds turbines. More specifically, they build the brains, the SCADA systems that operate these turbines. And they were doing very well. They were very successful, and they were growing and growing. And they decided to expand to China. And when they expanded to China, they partnered with this company called Cinevel. And Cinevel said, we'll be your professional services leg. You build it in the US. We'll deploy it all throughout Asia. And it was a great relationship for years until Cinevel said, why don't we cut the middleman out and not buy their stuff, and we'll just build it ourselves. The problem was they had self-decrypting code, and they had a whole bunch of stuff that they were doing right at American Superconductor, and they couldn't get access to it. And then there was this guy, who was a European contractor, living in China, working for Cinevel, the help of the deployments, that said, hey, guys, you know what? I've got access to the source code. But if I give you that, you have to give me something. And I'll let you read what he emailed on his office email to the executives at Cinevel. So that's what he wanted, and that's what he got. And there was a lot of email correspondence back and forth saying, oh, you're like Superman. You're so smart. We're going to take such good care of you. And he did. He gave him the code. So fast forward now a year. Cinevel has stripped all of their code. 
They've got other capabilities. They've cut American Superconductor out of the equation. American Superconductor lays off 600 employees, which is two-thirds of the company, loses over a billion dollars in share value. So that sucks right off the bat. So they said, we're going to sue China, because that always works out so well. Suing, suing China always uh, is a very fast and fruitful experience. So they sue them. So China says, oh, you're putting a lawsuit against us. We're going to send our hackers in, PLA Unit 61398, to hack into you. American Superconductor catches them. And they hacked into them so they could find out what their legal case was, what kind of evidence did they have, what, what kind of background, how are they going to mount their case against them. But they got caught. China fires them, and they bring in the Ministry of State Security. That's like their CIA. They said, PLA Unit 61398, you're out. CIA, you're in. Um, then... CNFL does something kind of interesting while this is all going on. They start selling these turbines with American superconductor code in them in what country do you think? Right here. Mostly being bought by US municipalities. And the code was so similar, there was comments in there like, Bob, let's fix this in the next iteration. It wasn't kind of similar. It was the same exact code. By the way, this guy now is, uh, is in prison. Does anybody recognize, this isn't the question, but does anybody recognize who this guy is? I'll give you a hint. This is in the 1930s. You can just yell it out. He was a bank robber. Dillinger. Yep, John Dillinger. John Dillinger did something that was pretty interesting. The way he used to get his guns and his ammunition is he used to rob police stations, which was pretty ballsy back, even back in the 30s to say, how are you going to get, I'm going to go rob that police station. Um, did anybody watch the uh, TV show uh, The Wire? It was a really good show on years ago. There was a character named Chalky White. Later on, he was on Boardwalk Empire. And he used to, he used to rob drug dealers. And I thought this was very, very similar in design to what, what Dillinger did. So he used to rob police stations to get his ammunition. For the $25 question, please raise your hand. Why is that similar to WannaCry? Yes, sir. Close, close. Does anybody else want to take a shot at it? No? Wanna Cry was based on Eternal Blue. Eternal Blue was developed by the NSA. It got robbed and leaked by a group called Shadow Brokers. And then it ended up infecting over 100 countries and 250,000 hits on it. Somebody robbed the NSA and used those weapons against the rest of the world. Right? So that was something that was powerful about Wanna Cry and the things that followed Wanna Cry that were based on the same patterns, like not patch and things like that, which was a different attack, but the exact same behavior and framework. So now I go into companies today, and I hear things like, Brian, we don't have to worry about any of these use cases you talked about, because we're in the cloud. <laughs> the cloud saves us all. To which I say, if you look at attacks that happen in the cloud, by and large, they aren't sophisticated attacks that brought systems down or stole data. Is because if you're setting up a system in your own local data center, it's pretty hard to physically plug your customer database or web server on the wrong side of the firewall, on the internet-facing side of the firewall. You could do it, but you got to change your DNS and your routing. It's, it, 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 there's a lot of things that warning bells should be going off. With a couple keystrokes, most of you know, I'm sure all of you are familiar with the cloud, um, you could put your segmentation in the wrong order, so instead of going ABC, it's going BAC, right? So segmentation errors are a couple keystrokes, boom, boom, boom. Now all of a sudden I've got something exposed. Nine out of 10 attacks that I see that people are talking about, oh, the cloud was hacked. It wasn't hacked, they had the segmentation wrong. The database was on the wrong side. There was nothing sophisticated about it. Not that I have anything against the cloud. The cloud's great, I'm just saying it's much easier actually to make those types of mistakes. You have to be a little bit more cautious and certainly keep an eye on things like that. The other thing I heard of is, oh, we've got an MSSP. They're providing all our security, to which I'll share this case. We're working with an insurance company um, in a state not too far from here. And these guys said, we've got this MSSP. We want to go ahead and evaluate how everything's going. So we came in, my company, Verid, and we did some analysis. Uh, a couple of the attacks were detected, maybe about 15 20%. Nothing was prevented, um, which really pissed off the CISO of this insurance company. So he says, guys, will you get on the phone with me and the CEO of this MSSP? He said, sure. So we all get on this call, and this guy just rips into him for like 15 minutes. It felt like 15 hours. It was pretty, pretty rough. Um, much worse than Marconi. 
Um, so he's ripping into this guy. He's going through this thing, and the CEO of the MSSP lets him go. And eventually he just says, okay, great, you're right. We should have done a better job in detecting. We're going to kind of look and see where we missed the boat there. We're going to improve it. But I want to make it clear, we're not now, nor have we ever been providing preventative controls for you, ever. And if you look at the SLA agreement, and they had been partnered with this MSSP for over two years, the CISO assumed they were providing preventative controls, and the MSP was not providing preventative controls. It was not part of the SLA. So for two years, these guys thought that they were preventing things when they were just doing detection and response. Not a hack, simply a business issue. So we see that all the time as well. And the biggest thing that we run into now, I'm seeing this all the time, is environmental drift. This idea that I bought this tech, and maybe it does what the vendor said. That's the first thing that's great. And maybe I deployed it perfectly, so it's actually deployed the way it's supposed to be deployed. But is the way that it's working last week the way that's working today and the way it's going to work next week? Do I have any way to evaluate to make sure that my tools are actually providing value? I see this all the time. You know, when I was at ArcSight, we did POCs for, for ArcSight for SIM technology that would last a year. People would spend 15, 16, 20 million dollars on their SIM technology. Then Bob and IT sticks a proxy server in place that they need to, doesn't tell the security guys. Now, 80% of the log files that were supposed to be going into the SIM are not, and nobody knows why, and months are going by, and nobody detects it. It wasn't because anybody did something malicious. It was just environmental drift. Somebody sets up a tap, FireEye. I think FireEye is a great product if you deploy it properly. But somebody had deployed FireEye in the network. When they deployed it, they set it up with a unidirectional tap, so it only saw traffic going one way. If FireEye doesn't see traffic going two ways, it just ignores everything. It was a $14 million grilled cheese sandwich. It didn't do anything on the network. Not because anybody did anything malicious. It was a $5 error caused a $14 million issue. So we see these things all the time, people not having a way to automate the process of, of testing and validating their tools. Oh, time for another joke. This one's much better than the last one, by the way. So there's three sailors, and they're on a boat. And they each have a cigarette, but they don't have any matches or any way to light it. So one sailor takes a cigarette, and he throws it into the ocean. And the other two are like, what are you doing? That's, how does that help? He goes, guys, relax. I just made us a cigarette lighter. Was that better than the Roman one? God, read it. You're... When I can't tell saucy jokes, thanks, HR. Um, so we talked before about sometimes good comes from bad. I shared my Steve Wozniak story um, and some other examples of that. And uh, I want to kind of tie this to the uh, kind of medieval era and kind of walk you through this. So hang, hang with me for a little bit as we kind of go through this. So in 2300 BC, Italy, they had the scratch plow. It didn't go very deep. It could up, upsoil some, some stuff. You could plant enough seed to basically feed your family. So it's pretty, pretty basic. Yet into about 900 AD, we had the heavy plow. The heavy plow could get really deep and actually go into clay, which is much richer in nutrients, which means now when you plant things, you can grow so much that you have a surplus. What do you do when you have a surplus? You sell the excess. You got to go to a place to sell this, so bigger cities started coming together. So you started to have the formation of these larger cities, right? And then you had the beginning of the Renaissance in 1300, mostly in Italy, but other places like uh, Constantinople and, and London and things like that. I'm Greek, so we still call it Constantinople. We don't call it Istanbul. So then we uh, say, OK, all these people are coming to the city to uh, sell their, their excess grain, whatever it is that they have. But they also come in there for trade, for jobs, for food, for security, for all these other reasons. So you have massive people congregating cities. Not, some of them aren't farmers at all. And you've got these monks. And these monks have this unique skill. That skill is they copy books. And writing books back then meant you had somebody that would treat animal skins and tan them, somebody that would actually make papyrus, somebody that would mix inks, somebody that would actually write, somebody that would actually draw, somebody that would actually color, somebody that puts the gold on them and the ivory and all this stuff. And after a year or two, you actually have a book written in Latin, and it was a very small percentage of the population that could get value from it, and they were very, very expensive. So literacy wasn't that high, but you had these books. So that was interesting. So all these people are in the city. They don't know anything about germs and bacteria or sanitation. Pretty much all they know is don't drink dirty water. Right? So they're throwing their feces out the window, and they're doing all these horrible things that we would look down upon today. If you've ever watched Monty Python, The Holy Grail, it was kind of like that. Um, dysentery, cholera, typhoid, all these problems were happening. Uh, there was some global warming that was happening at this time as well that caused a lot of rats 
to come in from the fields and move into the cities because a lot of the, the lands that they were living in were drying up. At the same time, we had the Silk Road, the real Silk Road from Mongolia, not the Silk Road where you hire people to kill your wife. But we had the Silk Road trade, and we had ships coming in from the Caspian Sea, and we had ships coming in from the Black Sea. The Silk Road and these ships were filled with rats. These rats had fleas. Those fleas carried this bacteria, and that bacteria, as we all know, was the Black Plague, right? Which wiped out a significant portion of Europe and the world. So now, all our monks are dead. Who's going to make books now? So Gutenberg, a blacksmith, as you guys know, Gutenberg Press, said, hey, I'm going to create this thing with movable types so we can actually go ahead and make books faster. And you could have multiple presses per factory and multiple factories per location. And they went from doing about 10 to 40 pages a day by monks to doing about 3,600 pages a day. And a Bible, a Bible is about 800 pages. So they were able to mass produce books really, really, really quickly, which was great because then that increased literacy. The problem was people actually said, well, I didn't know I had bad eyes until I was trying to read. So while eyeglasses were actually developed in the 1200s, not by Ben Franklin, that was bifocals, but in the 1200s, hardly anybody had them because nobody could read. But now people could read, so there was a lot more eyeglasses, which led to advancements in lens creation, which leads to, leads to microscopes, telescopes, et cetera. All these things lead to advancements in STEM. So because of the Black Plague, we have everything that came out of the Renaissance, whiskey, champagne, clocks, flushable toilets, and we also have city improvements. Hey, if someone's walking into our city, they're covered with warts, and they're coughing out blood, maybe we sit them someplace else. Or maybe let's not put all our garbage and crap in the well that we drink out of. Basic things today. Again, they didn't know about bacteria. That didn't happen until... Pastor. But they knew enough that they should start doing this, so they learned from their mistakes. So if we look at the digital renaissance, coming back to what we talked about uh, much earlier, we converge on the cities just like we do the internet. Same reasons. Commerce, jobs, education, art, entertainment, it's all the same, right? When we converged, we had all these serious issues. Sure, we don't have the black plague. You can't get plague yet from a USB. But You've got ransomware, you've got cyber criminals, you've got nation states, you've got all this malicious stuff happening. So what do we do? We respond, and we respond with vigor. Endpoint security, email security, network security, cloud security, certifications for this and audits for that and all these things. But at the end of the day, it's still not effective. Why? Why is that? What's the problem? So we... Uh, we Created this report, which is pretty unique. Gartner just wrote about it recently. It's free. If you go to our website, I think you just put in your email, you can download it. It's a, it's a security effectiveness report. And we didn't look at things from a threat perspective or zero day or APT. We just said, how effective are your actual security tools? Your checkpoint, your silence, your carbon black, your Palo Altos. Let's validate the effectiveness of your tools by safely executing real attacks in your, in your production network to validate the efficacy of those controls. So according to those tools, a real attack is happening, and now you're trying to measure if your tools are actually designed to protect them. Not if your Apache web server isn't patched, not if Oracle has this vulnerability. You can use scanning and pen testing for all that, but actually validating the security tools. And in doing this study across hundreds and hundreds of customers, what was discovered on, on average, 25% of preventative controls actually work. Not because they have bad tools or bad people, or they even deployed them incorrectly, but they never had a tool to validate that that thing that was supposed to do X is actually doing X. We've never been able to measure it. In the decades of cybersecurity, we've never had a way to measure it. Worse, about half of the attacks you don't even see. Forget about prevention. Prevention's cheap. Either the attack's blocked or it's not. It's all automated. It's in the background. Detection is when the humans kick in, and response is when the humans kick in and the processes. Half the time, they don't even know they're being attacked because their detection's not proper because they have a signature in their IPS. Instead of a space, they put a tab or a colon, they put a semicolon, right? Because there's no way to validate if that thing was doing what it was supposed to do. And then on the SIM side, on the correlation, we're actually doing aggregation analysis of this stuff. 22% of the time, your SIM rules are actually firing on probably your most expensive cybersecurity tool, where people on average spend five to six million dollars on it. It works 22% of the time. Pretty horrible stats. When we go into customers, we always tell them, look, the baby's going to be ugly. It's not because you're bad. It's not your fault. It's not your technology. It's the fact that you've never had a way to actually measure this thing. How, everything's guesswork. 
It's like telling somebody, yeah, go write a thousand lines of code and don't bother compiling it. I'm sure it's all going to work fine. I mean, come on. It doesn't pass the duh test. Right? But the result of this is this. You have poor rationalization. I don't know where I need to invest in new security gear. I don't know what security gear is actually working. I don't know how to prioritize. I probably have a whole bunch of shit that I'm paying for every year for support and maintenance that I don't need. And wouldn't it be great if I got rid of that that I didn't need? And I went ahead and put that into people and training and products that I actually need. I still put time, money, and resources into my security tools, hoping, praying that something will work. But maybe it doesn't. And the worst part is security leaders at this point, the folks that are tasked with doing security, when the boss says, are we safe from WannaCry or Bad Rabbits or not Petcha or any of these attacks? The answer is always the same. It's qualitative. Well, we follow best practices. We do a lot of patching and vulnerability scanning. We just had a PCI audit. It's not quantitative. Yes, we are or no, we're not with empirical evidence-based decisions because they had no way to measure before. And it puts you in the situation where you simply cannot be effective. You have to change the game. So for this $25 question here, who thinks they can name at least four people on this slide? And I'll, I'll do a couple of things here to make it easier. This guy is Mickey Cochran. Don't worry about him. He was the manager for the Detroit Tigers back in the 30s. Not important. But who wants to take a shot at naming, naming some people here for 25 bucks? And this is in the 1930s, by the way. Yes, sir, in the back. Yep. Yep. Oh, yeah, yeah. This guy we already talked about once. Yep, Dillinger. Yep. And you know who this guy is? What if he had a dress on? Would you recognize him? Hoover. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I don't know if he really did. He probably did. Um, so at this particular time, there was no FBI. Robbing a bank was not a federal crime. If you robbed a bank in Arkansas and you were able to make it all the way over to Texas, nobody could cross that line. They still might follow you and try to shoot you, but legally they couldn't cross that line. There were no federal crimes yet. The first federal crime came from the Lindbergh baby kidnapping. They said we should make kidnapping a federal crime. So at this point, two things made bank robbers super successful. The first one was interstate freeway systems, highway systems. And the second thing was fast cars with V8 engines. Again, we look at it today, that's not that advanced, but just like the Greeks with steel and compared to iron, it was. So Hoover said, guys, guys being FDR, FDR, we need to go ahead and change the game because we're getting our asses kicked. And FDR said, I don't want to make government big, because at that point in history, government was really, really small, not this massive thing that we know it to be today. And this was before the New Deal. So even at this point, FDR was like, I don't want government to be big. I don't want a Federal Bureau of Investigation. So Hoover said, do me a favor. Let's at least enact a law that says that bank robbery is a federal crime. He said, fine, I'll give you that, Hoover. So in 1934, we enacted the Federal Bank Robbery Act, 1934, in February. A couple months later, Bonnie and Clyde get killed, Dillinger gets killed, Babyface Nelson gets killed. All right, they hunted him down and killed them all. It was successful. They changed the game. What happened in 1935? The Bureau of Investigation becomes the Federal Bureau of Investigation. That's how all this happened. And it happened because they had to change the game because what was working for them had stopped working. It was no longer successful. Fast cars and the highway system changed the game, so they had to change it back. And honestly, when we talk about security today, that's what it's about. It's about being able to say, I need to stop thinking about zero days and APTs and from a threat perspective. Instead, let me focus on it from the perspective of my security controls so I can actually validate if those tools are working, and if they're not, I know how to fix them. So I was told to remind everybody to fill out the forms or whatever you're supposed to do to review this talk at the end. But thanks so much, guys. Thanks for hanging with me. Be a great crowd. Bye-bye.